about China and the Korean War uh, during this period, the 1950s. Uh, it's important to kind of understand China's role in, in the international politics scene, right? How they dealt with other countries uh, during this time. So this is considered the People's Republic of China. That's its full appropriate name uh, because there is a government on the island of Formosa, also known as Taiwan, uh, that claims to be the legitimate Chinese government, right? And so they call themselves the People's Republic to distinguish themselves from Taiwan. Um, and that's still a dispute that happens today between Taiwan and um, and the People's Republic of China, right? There's this tension there. China claims to the People's Republic of China claims to to have rights over the island of Taiwan, uh, and Taiwan disagrees, right? And so there's a source of tension that still exists and shapes uh, some parts of world politics today. Uh, for a long time, the United States only backed Taiwan uh, and did not recognize the People's Republic of China. Um, they did not recognize Mao Zedong and his government as the rightful government of the Chinese people, and instead referred to the People's Republic of China as Red China, right? Red being the color associated with communism. Uh, over, over the years, as relationships improved slightly, the United States did recognize the People's Republic of China, but does also recognize the government in Taiwan, so it represent, recognizes them as two separate countries. This is a pretty interesting image here, and it's important in understanding uh, a key relationship during the Cold War, and it's the relationship between China and Russia, right? So you can see both these animals here have the hammer and sickle symbol, which is the classic symbol of the Communist Party, right? And it's obvious that China here, it says China is also symbolized by a dragon, right? And Russia is symbolized by a bear, kind of the typical symbols of these two countries. Um, and so they're both communist countries, but if you take a look at this image, right, it kind of becomes clear, you get the hint that they did not necessarily get along. Um, and this tension between these two communist nations uh, is really important because if they didn't have this tension, it could have led to a much more powerful coalition, but instead it kind of weakens communism's image and strength around the world because it's not united. When communism, by its very ideology, should be united, right, across national lines. Because remember, it's not a ba based on nation, it's not supposed to be anyway, it's supposed to be based on uh, social class. And so there's a few reasons why the Chinese and the Russians or Soviet Communist parties or governments did not get along. Uh, the main difference is the role the peasants should play in the revolution. Uh, Lenin, right, inspired by Marx, uh, creates this communist ideology that says the working class will rise up and defeat the capitalists who own the means of production. Um, but communism can't work like that in China at that time because China was not industrialized. They did not have a strong industry sector. They did not have a lot of factories or a clear, well-defined working class population. What they did have was a, a large group of peasants who were being mistreated. Uh, and so people like Mao Zedong recognized them as the essential aspect to the, to the rise to the rise of communism in China. Right, so whereas the industrial workers were the key part of the Soviet Union's efforts to create communism and to promote communism once it starts, China can't have that, right? They have to use the peasants. In principle, right, uh, Leninism, right, establishes this idea of a vanguard or an elite group of people who are going to lead the revolution. So while it's supposed to be the collective control, right, of the working class, they recognize, and, and Lenin and his followers recognize that there needs to be a group of people who have to lead the revolution. In China, the, under Mao, they think it just should be the peasants, right? Although, as we learn, right, from the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, uh, this kind of disappears, this idea of the peasants leading it, because a group of people like Mao end up leading these, and directing these things with complete power. But at least initially, this was kind of the difference, right? It should be the peasants leading things, not an elite group like it was in the Soviet Union. So by 1959, um, these disputes over ideology, right? The peasants versus the working class, the elite group versus the peasants ruling, um, and disputes over borders, because North Korea, uh, sorry, because China and so the Soviet Union do share borders, is actually a break in the alliance. Uh, they uh, no longer kind of cooperate with each other. 
the West, uh, for obvious reasons, welcomes this, right? This is taken as the opportunity to then <coughs> to kind of cause a wedge in between the two communist powers and, and, and weaken the Soviet Union. Um, and so they do do this, but there's also deep tension prior leading up to this between the United States and China over the Korean Peninsula, right? Which before 1959, we know in the early 1950s, there's war that actually happens because of this. So just to kind of show you an image here to show you how they're connected, right? Because a lot of times when we think of the Soviet Union or Russia, we tend to think of Europe. But the vast majority of the Soviet Union and the vast majority of Russia, even to this day, is actually in Asia. Uh, and so there's massive amounts of land that borders two countries, these two countries, right? All the way here, this is what, there's Manchuria, uh, Mongolia, which was under Soviet control for a while. Um, and this territory here, all the way down here, is all borders shared between the two countries and can cause tension. Shifting focus now between China and the Soviet Union to China and the West, right? The democratic or capitalist societies in Western Europe and the United States. Again, right, there's this deep tension over Korea with China and the United States. Um, this tension eases once the war ends and once China and Soviet Union split, split and their alliance is no longer working. Uh, and the United States then continuing the idea of, started under Truman, right, of containment, want to continue to contain the Soviet Union. And so they figured by becoming closer allies or, or more friendly at least, not necessarily allies, but more friendly with China, that they can further contain the Soviet Union. So in 1971, the United States allows or encourages and gets China admitted to the United Nations. And they're shortly after added to the Security Council. So they're now one of the five permanent members of the Security Council, which gives them a lot of power. Uh, in 1972, President Nixon visits China, the first United States president to do so. Um, and this is kind of known as ping pong diplomacy because in, I believe the year prior to this, um, the United States sent a ping pong team over to China, right, to compete against the Chinese because the Chinese are really into ping pong. Um, and that was known as kind of an opening up of, of friendships between the two. And that's why it's called ping pong diplomacy. Um, a few years later, in 1979, formal di diplomatic relations are established. So what this means is that uh, the United States sends an ambassador and creates an embassy in China. And the same thing happens in Washington, D.C. with the Chinese. So that's in 1979. So as the Cold War progresses, the United States sees a better relationship with China as a way to limit and weaken the power of the Soviet Union. All right, this we talked about in class. Uh, but just quickly to go over it again, right? Korea is one of the first, uh, first proxy wars that occur during this period period. Um, and it's fought between the communists in the northern Korea, North Korea and the non-communists in the South Korea, right? Both are dictators originally. One is the communist dictator Kim Il-sung, whose descendants are still in charge of North Korea today, who is Kim, Kim Jong-un. Uh, and then also a dictator in the South, right? Syngman Rhee. The war lasts for three years. Um, initially, the North Koreans surprise attacked the South Koreans, almost taking over the entire peninsula. When the United States steps in, though, they establish a defensive perimeter around the city of Busan, led by D Douglas MacArthur, the, the war hero from World War II. Um, he also then launches an invasion on the Incheon Peninsula behind enemy lines, surprising the North Koreans and pushing them back. Um, the U.S. forces the North Koreans all the way back to the border of China at the Yalu River, um, which makes the Chinese nervous. Right, so again, on the map, just visualizing what was going on, right? how they launched an attack behind enemy lines, then pushed them all the way up north. So China's role in this was kind of motivated by fear, right? They were feared an invasion of the United States and the United Nations. Again, because this is before, right, we learned that just before that China becomes part of the United Nations in 1971. This is in 1950, 1953, right? So this is before they're part of the United Nations. So they send in troops to help the North to stop the United States from advancing. 
And with this new influx of, of support from the Chinese, the North are able to North Koreans are able to push the Americans and the South Koreans back to the 38th parallel, the original border between the two. Uh, and then again, a stalemate occurs, right? There's no progress between either side. 1953, an armistice is signed. Again, an armistice is not a peace treaty. It's an agreement to stop fighting, what's called a ceasefire, until a peace treaty can be made. Uh, and none such, none such peace treaty has been made. So technically, they're in a state of war. Um, and every once in a while, there's gunfire exchange across the border. But overall, the armistice has lasted. Uh, it established what was called the demilitarized zone, abbreviated as the DMZ. Uh, and it's free of military from either side. So there's this territory... On the 30th parallel between the North and South Koreans, um, that no soldiers are allowed to cross through. If anyone does cross through there, through there, that's often when open firing starts and when the ceasefire is at risk of being ruined. Right, because on, on each side of this DMZ is a very strong military presence from each country. All right, this is kind of showing you the armistice line, right? Um, and what makes up now South and North Korea, right? The city of Seoul, which is in South Korea, the capital is pretty close to this line, right? So there's always this heightened risk uh, and fear among South Koreans, anxiety that the North, if they launched again, they could easily get to their capital city. And up here, we can see the Yalu River, right? So they pushed them pretty far North, uh, initially the Americans, right? Before the Chinese stepped in and prevented that from staying that way. So after the Korean War, uh, what's going on in the Korean Peninsula. In 1987, the South Korean dictatorship, right, Sigmund Rhee, is ousted by protesters and they institute a democratic government. Um, and to this day, South Korea is democratic uh, and it had a pretty impressive and rapid modernization and, and, and growth in, in wealth, right? So today it's a very wealthy country. Um, it is home to many important um, world companies like uh, Samsung, and um, other, other co companies like that. In the North, the Kim family continues to rule even to this day. After Kim Il-sung, it was Kim Jong-il, and now it's Kim Jong-un, right? And so there's all these, the father to son, right, past three generations. Um, they keep it under strict communist command economy. The, the government's in charge of everything. It's a complete total dictatorship, uh, and they are, have fallen behind the world. They have, people are starving, they're poor, uh, almost all their money is, is put into the military and trying to develop nuclear weapons. Right, and so this is why it's, North Korea is still kind of relevant today because this is fear that what looks like an unstable dictatorship will produce a nuclear weapon, which is not what anybody wants. Like I said, the Kim Il Sung, Kim Jong Il, Kim Jong Un the three rulers of North Korea. All right, so using this information, there's gonna be some questions posted on the harbor that you can answer in the text box uh, to kind of make sure you understand what's going on in Korea and in China during this first part of the Cold War.